how are you today? You're looking fine. I'm doing doing good, man. I uh, it's Friday, which is still my favorite day of the week. Yeah, it was since I was a kid, you know, it's like you got 48 hour buffer on the backside, I and mean, tonight can be really fun. You get work done in the first half of the day, and you play in the second half. I got all my. I had a really good week of getting stuff in order, meaning I was I stayed down at a um, at our getaway house with my son, and kind of just got everything in order so I can head out because I got some projects I'm about to head out on so I can go out without having to look over my shoulder yeah physically, mentally and I got it I re I'm really happy with where I got to this week I, I got you, stuff together and I dispatched it um, you work on the weekend or do you take the day do you take some time off no, I do um I, if I can I don't carve out hours, but I, I kind of, my office moves with me and my laptop moves to the, is in the kitchen bar half the time, the back porch. Right. Um, and then writing, I've never sat down and said, oh, I'm going to write. I just take notes whenever it comes to mind 24 seven, and then just have a look at the end of the month and go, what was I thinking about? You know, where was my yeah. head? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, yeah. I mean, I understand because the problem is when you're all in the ideas space, there are no boundaries, which is a beautiful thing, but can also be a curse. Yeah. When you uh -huh. been there, the subplots become unmanageable. Uh -huh. like I'm seeing art in every single thing and everything uh, yeah. significant. And if everything is significant, nothing has significance. And I'm like going, I got to relax. Yeah, no. And I mean, if you're like me, then the way to do it, I mean, if you're, if you're going to sleep thinking about the project and waking up thinking about the project, the only solution is prayer. It sure does help, doesn't it? I, I I've been needing a little more demarcation, yeah. At the day and at the beginning of the day, and I've actually picked up again the book that changed my life, "The Greatest Sales in the World" by Ogmandino. And uh -huh. second chapter, the second scroll is all about I will greet this day with love in my heart, and it's just a four-page sort of meditative read. Yeah, and. I just picked it up again. I haven't picked it up in 15 years. And that, I noticed that I'm actually that, when I follow that with prayers and go through the photos of all my loved ones and see them in their truest state and say, yeah. thanks, I sleep better. For sure. I, you read The Way of a Pilgrim? You know the book? No. The Way of a Pilgrim. It's by an anonymous Russian monk. It was written in about 1880. And it's the, it chronicles the use of the Orthodox Jesus prayer, which is the meditative prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he says it 10,000 times a day. And he talks about how it gradually changes his life. Uh -huh. I read that book. I read it 10 years ago. And I've gone to sleep every single night for 10 years saying the Jesus prayer. He said it 10,000 times a day. Yeah, well, that's that's what the Russian monks do. I don't, I'm no Russian monk, yeah, right? Okay. Um, I mean, I'm... So yeah. that turned into a, does that, how, you know, when we get mantras, yeah, you know, we get, we get prayers and you hear people do it all the time and they start doing the hell of and all of a sudden they become abbreviated. Yeah. You know, and we kind of wrote over them or we contract or we cut right. out certain words and we speed them up and read them faster. What's, what's it trigger for you now after you've been doing it for so long when you say it, is it a real exhale? Yeah. So on the inhale, Lord Jesus Christ, on the exhale, have mercy on me. And so you're breathing what you want for yourself and for the world. And what you wind up doing is you you replace the monkey mind, which is what's been I mean, and it, it becomes quite natural. And it becomes it's interesting because when you talk to people who do transcendental meditation and such, that's what they talk about with their mantra. But this is a mantra that really is, it's it, its not home, it's aspirational. Uh -huh. it, it truly is what I want for my life and what I want for the world in this particular way. And it, quite practically, it puts me to sleep without having me go to sleep thinking about my work. Because otherwise, I'm doomed, I'm a prisoner. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about your work, you wake up thinking about your work, you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about your work. Yeah. yeah. And it's not, it's not healthy, right? Although... I have had, I mean, although my 2 a.m. wake up in the middle of the night ideas. Yeah, yeah. Probably paid more of my rent than my 10 a.m. ideas. <laughs> but I, but I, but I, but I hear you. It's almost like yeah. 
you can even I, I sometimes I'll get you know how you get a song stuck in your head and you end up uh, speaking with the rhythm of that song or dreaming to the rhythm of that song. You're like, yeah. get this song out of my head. I can find myself sometimes dreaming to the rote pace of my work or or or, or what what my plan is. And I want to get and I'm like, I don't want to be. That's the wrong rhythm. That's the yeah. wrong instrument. I don't that's not the instrument I want to be dreaming to. Uh-huh. I ha it's pretty interesting how people who work in the creative space are trying to use all of these nooks and crannies of, you know, the conscious and unconscious for the good of the creative, mm. but not letting those things manage you and not man let letting those things manage your heart, because this isn't just another form of workaholism that we can fall into that can be quite dangerous, of right. course, because then we become productivity machines and even even slaves to this to this productive impulse of our creativity. It's funny how how we are ambitious creatures, isn't it? Yeah, and I love it. But then I have to remind myself all the time, Jay, buddy, 24 hours in a day, and as far as I'm checking, no one's given any more time. And uh -huh. what are these other qualitative things that you have in your life that need yeah. a slow nurture, that ha may have no reason, they just have rhyme. It's the laughter or a good joke with the family or sitting down for a meal that you're like, this may not technically be measurably, metrically productive, but this is as high of a quality of a situation as I could be in. And, yeah. and, and I mean, I, I can do it. When I go to, I can become a workaholic. I try to set my zones though. Meaning, when I went away to write the book, I was averaging 17 hours a day. Yeah, because you couldn't stop. I was on the fever. I, was, yeah. I, was, I had the fever. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, I know. I know the feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, the walls were padded. I was out on my own and I was, you know, would get sleep when I could get it. And there, but there wasn't anything else. I didn't have cell phone service. I didn't have an internet. So it was sort of a monk like obsession to go away. Um, but to turn that off when I came back home was tough duty. And actually was tough to actually listen to other, the, the mendacious ways that we talk. You ever done like a silent retreat and you come back yeah. and you hear yourself and you're like, listen to the BS that's coming out. Know, every year, every year. Yeah. Every year I do it. And, and I'm telling you, the first 24 hours, there's children screaming in my head. You know? <laughs> The dead souls of the lost or something. Yeah. yeah. 24, this starts to calm down. And then coming back into ordinary life is very tough. Very tough. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Part of the thing that I find actually when I do that is I find how bad I was, how, how what a twisted and distorted sense I had of myself, um, how I was objectifying myself. Do you know this feeling? You know, it, I, I don't know. Did your dad teach you that it was a grave sin to objectify a woman? Yeah. Did your dad teach you that? And we believe that. I'm sure you teach your son that too, right? <clears throat> yeah, we actually had to talk about it three weeks ago. Yeah. And you should never objectify somebody because they're famous or because they're rich. You should never reduce somebody to a this one of these qualities. We do that to ourselves. We self-objectify constantly. So... Cause on that, I love, I love this subject because I know when I'm overly tired, overly fatigued, I start to objectify people, the world. Mm -hmm. I call what my eye gets low. My, I go, oh, you, you got a low eye right now. You need a nap, McConaughey. You need to, to, to rest and right. revive. And then when I'm rolling, when I'm got good energy, I'm not objectifying anyone. Every woman's a sister. Every man's a brother. I look in the mirror. Right. I see a friend. Now, this right. objectification of self, especially in the world we're in today, which sells objectification. We're all sold daily to, while we're in the game, running the kickback, to look at our jumbotron and see how we're doing. You know what I mean? That, 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 that um, what is it? it the dopamine was highest 20 years ago when you climbed the top of the mountain. Then it became higher when you when you got proof and took the picture that you climbed the top of the mountain. And now it's highest when you press send and share it. Yeah. To be objectified. Exactly and right. I think we, I like the idea of hopping outside myself and say, hey, is what you're doing actually, what you think you're doing actually what you're doing? You know? Let's let's let play a song. I'm really good on guitar, maybe I think, until I go, well, let's record that and listen to it back. Oh, right, not right. as good as I thought. Or hey, I'm right on. But 
I myself, and I think a lot of people can get hung up over there in the third person. When in the place to be, if, if we use objectification to come back and be more subjective, then isn't it metrically the most useful? Yeah. So here's the way that the Zen Buddhist would talk about it. And I'm sure you're familiar with this as well. So Zen Buddhism sort of strips Buddhism down to the attitude of observation. And they talk an awful lot. And so have the Western philosophers. How So has William James, for example. He talked about the I self versus the me self. This is one of the things that we talk about in my happiness class at, at, at the Harvard Business School. So we say, you can observe the world or you can be observed. And you need both, by the way. You need your me self so you understand who you are. You understand what your relationships are. You can drive in traffic and you don't get in a crash. But the I self of observing the rest of the world, that's where the action is for you to be a complete person. When you're yeah. looking at your notifications on social media, when you're looking in the mirror, when you're thinking about not the not looking at the Eiffel Tower, but you're taking a selfie of yourself in front of the Eiffel Tower, that's the me self when it should be the I self. And that's where self-objectification becomes really tyrannical and will ruin your happiness. Plus, it'll ruin your productivity, it'll ruin your creativity, it'll ruin your relationships and everything else. Amen. I was having this conversation with my son who's 14 and we're investigating what form of social media future he will have. Right. There's none yet. And I forgot who it was. I think it was somebody on that bike trip, one of the fathers. There were a lot of fathers on that bike trip to Vietnam. That I, was, I wish I could wait. It, it was very tasty. It was good. And we had a lot yeah. of fathers. We would just like, I remember correctly, we would talk about being sons going up the hill and fathers coming down the hill. Anyway, one of them, I believe they said, look, what this the social media thing is what he told his kids. He was like, as long as you continue to do what you like to do, who be who you are, and then say, oh, you know what? Why don't I record that instead of walking out every day or get, waking up going, what can I do that would be a good post? Or what can I do that can get the most likes? Who's wagging who? And it, and, and it was a really good way to put it. It made a lot of sense to me about going... Oh yeah, who's wagging who? That 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 me and the I self because if you're if you're if you're is it a hyper is it an it's not a hyper awareness it's an extended awareness what is it it's a it's a it's too aware in a way right yeah 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 I mean it's weird because what it is is it's um <clears throat> you're not vigilant of what's actually going on around you. You, what you're thinking about is how you're reflected on what's going on around you. So what it is, is derivative. It's yeah. the derivative yeah. self, right? Yeah. And that's very, is highly distorted. It's not satisfying. It doesn't give you proper information. I mean, it's just, it's, and, and the problem is that all our impulses and all our incentives in society are to do that more, more yeah. of that, you know, more reflection, more. And here's the other thing that's really interesting, Matthew, that I actually see in the research. When you we're in a society that says you have to judge everything all the time. You have to judge everything. All. That's good. This coffee's bad. This traffic sucks. This weather's hot. We got to have an opinion about everything. And now the problem with that is when we have to have an opinion about everything, we're opening ourselves up to judgment all the time, which is pure me self. If you can actually live part of your life as in the gospel of St. Matthew, judge not lest ye be judged that is not just the secret to getting into the heaven that's 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 the secret of happiness mm. Mm. the ju judgment let's talk talk about um you have the, the in the in the version of the i the me and the ego let's talk about is the ego getting a bad rap as like people are like oh kill the ego is it that we have to have a sense of the I, to have yeah. judgment you have, you have to have me self. You have to have me self or you don't know where you are. You literally wouldn't be able to physically walk around if you couldn't situate yourself, to be sure. The problem is getting the balance right. If, right. You, if, you, if you obliterated the me self, you'd be a mess. You'd, you'd probably get run over on your first day, you know? Yeah. But everybody I've ever met needs less me self. Nobody has that problem. It's too hard. So all of us need techniques to keep working on that, to judge less, to look less. You know, it's actually, I worked with a guy one time who's pretty interesting. And his problem was that he was a, he was a fitness 
influencer fitness model kind of guy. This is somebody who's looking in the mirror constantly. So he's looking on Instagram, what people are saying about his body. It's very unhealthy. I mean, really, really unhealthy, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. what he did to get out of that, because he was profoundly miserable, but you know, he was undernourished and he was, you know, lots and lots of things were wrong in his life. He started, he, he, he took all of the mirrors out of his house. Uh -huh. He literally took the mirrors out of his house. He started showering in the dark. <laughs> he started basically making it impossible for him to look at his body. And he said it changed his life. He ah, said, it <laughs> that's great. I'm that. I love, I love little engineering tricks, meaning like that. Let's take the mirror. I, I want to I be less conscious about body. I'm to get rid of the mirrors and take a shower, take showers in the dark. Or like, hey, I, if you, you always say this. If you want to lose weight, forget that exercise program. Just get rid of all the forks and spoons and eat with chopsticks and see what happens. Or, yeah. or, 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 or uh, 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 in, in Mali, Africa, in the center of town, when the, when the, um, when the chief would bang on the djembe to call the meeting into town. And I was over there one time. The whole town farmers came in and we went to the center of town and we all ducked under this little sort of, wasn't a lean-to because the roof, but it was only like the roof was like four feet off the ground. And we were all in there and we were all sitting down and everyone had a conversation. And I went to the chief afterward. I was like, what? Why don't you raise the roof? So hard. He goes, no, no, no. If the roof is high, people get very excited and they jump up and down and get very passionate like this, 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 this. Because the roof is low, we have civil conversation. And I was like, yeah. what an engineering feat. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's you're, the you're introducing that's discomfort. discomfort. You're introducing discomfort on purpose to throw you out of the zone. And when you're paying, by the way, Matthew, this is exactly the same concept. When you throw yourself out of the zone of your own comfort, you're less able to focus on you. You're more likely to be in the I self state, looking outward, looking outward, looking outward, as opposed mm -hmm. to. You can't be as performative when you're not as comfortable, right. right? What do you, I mean, this is, this is an interesting question. What do you do as an actor so that you're not maximally comfortable? There's got to be something that you yeah. do. There's got to be a bunch of things you do, right? There, there, there is. Um, and my mentor, Penny Allen, who's now passed away of 19 years, who really was hands down my greatest mentor for acting, taught me my rights as an actor and everything. She would always say, okay, you've done all the homework. You're so prepared. That you, you know you 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 you're stable. You feel, you come into scenes like this. Your 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 haunches are wide. You're 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 ready to go left to right. She was like, "It's boring. It's not alive." I go, "What yeah. do you mean?" She goes, "Get your stability, but before you go into every scene, get on get on one leg, and and then when they call action, enter the scene hopping on one leg and see if you can find your balance. And when you find your balance in the scene, find your place." That's life happening. So it was actually a physiological tool that she taught me that was a metaphor for a lot of other things where I'll, I'll try and find four versions of the truth for a scene and play with them, mix and match them, do the first half in version one, the second half in version three. And just there's, there's quite a few different combinations there. So I can not anticipate, because after, after you do a scene well once, mm -hmm. And I always like to say this, after take one, it's all acting. That's really the first take where you just, it's live. We know when we do it well. The thing is, you do get objective. And you have to find, oh, that moment was great. And when that moment's great, when you notice it right after, the next time up, the battle is to go, don't anticipate that great moment coming up because you're going to kill it if you do. Or you're going to exaggerate it. You're going to put a little cherry, a little lanyap, you know, a little cherry on top, and it's going to be too much. Where the first time when it just happened, that was right. the one. So in good acting, and it doesn't always happen, a good actor can go back on take two and give you that beautiful moment like it's the first time. So right. that's something I always remind myself, no matter how many take 17, it's the first time. Or she would always say this to me. Try to screw up. I dare you. I dare you. Try and screw up. You can't. And that was an enlightening look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Off, like, yeah. Off That's super interesting because basically, the, I mean, the first take is the I self take. After that, it's increasingly me self takes. Yep. So this is what I find that as a, as a professor. It's a really interesting thing too. I 
my students understand what I'm talking about in lecture, not when I'm most prepared. Not when I'm most prepared. When I actually, so I, I put in in every lecture for classes I've taught over and over again, I teach the science of happiness at the Harvard Business School. And so I, I know this material cold, but I introduce material that I'm not comfortable with in every single lecture. Because when I'm not comfortable with it, I'm not in the zone of thinking, what do they think of me? Uh, thinking, what do they think of me? I'm not as good. They don't understand as well. It's not as fresh. Right. It's not, the quality just isn't, it's something's not right. And it's exactly right. the same thing you're saying to me, right? I mean, I suppose I could be Laurence Olivier of Harvard professors and, and, and simulate the I self and every me self mm -hmm. in, in take 17. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. You got to get the balance right. You have to master the material, obviously. You don't go into a movie not having looked at the script, obviously. No, I've tried that. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's that 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 thing. You study, you prepare. It's an, it's an above the neck. The beginning of the process is that. And it makes it actually very awkward. I know when I learned to become a better actor, the first two years, I felt like it was sublimating my instincts, which I believed in my instincts but I stuck with it and there was a bridge though before I got I was like oh now the head and my instincts are integrated with what I the old and the new meaning I've prepped now I can throw away the script and trust it um any script you study it up now I've got copious notes but on the day they're gone because I'm trusting that no, it's it's you either got it or you don't now. It's in you. Trust it. This is not about math now. Don't go back and go. This is not about a moment. This is about music now. Now we're playing. That's the right. other thing when we go to work. Your work's early. My work is in in pre production. Right. When I'm on set, if I'm doing a good job, it's all play. Yeah. And there is no script. Yeah, yeah. Now these ideas that you have and that we're talking about here. You mean you're in the human flourishing business. You've migrated from the entertainment in the world to the human flourishing world. I like that term. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, green light, art of living. This is human flourishing. This is not entertainment, man. This is deadly serious stuff. What made you do that? What made you do that? I mean, look, we can all stay in our lane. You know, we can. I'm in the human flourishing business, too. Mm -hmm. I, but I migrated to it. Right. right. I, I wound up there. What? You didn't have to do that. What? Why? Why did you do that? So, look, started I think with the with the with the book, which I was putting off for decades because I didn't have the confidence or the courage to look over my shoulder at my past. I've always been a next day forward. What's coming up? guy i mean i haven't even seen all my movies i like making them more than i like watching them. i like to just that's so interesting one one side note matthew entrepreneurial people live 80 percent in the future and we know this because we put people in fmri machines yeah. and we, we we induce what's called the default mode network which is think about nothing and look at the part of the brain that actually starts to get really active and the parts of the brain about future life about your planning etc with entrepreneurs is like 80 percent of the time huh. and so that's classic as an entrepreneurial person, that means that you can't look backward. You don't want the rearview mirror. That that bores you, the rearview mirror, right? You are like yeah. the windshield. Yeah, that's what you, that's what you want, right? Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's really interesting. And and and, and trust that I haven't been a tyrant in the rearview mirror, and you know, I didn't didn't knock it all out of the park. But trust that I didn't burn bridges, and I didn't lie, cheat, and steal, and I don't have people coming after me, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So to get the courage and the confidence to go away was something that maybe had to do with coming across 50, even though I'm not a numbers guy, maybe inherently that had to do with, hey, this is a number where to do some to little reflection. Um, family was stable. Yeah. Um, and then parry that with, parlay that with, it had some, some success. COVID came. I was at home. We were protecting my mom, so we were quite conservative on the quarantine. At the time, I started challenging myself of what if, all right, you make movies. This was a thought with the book. Before the book, I'm in a, in a movie, I'm acting in someone else's script that they wrote, playing another character, being directed by someone else, 
lensed through a camera by someone else and edited by someone else. So there's five filters from my raw expression. Yeah. And I was like, man, I want to get rid of some of the filters. I wrote the book. I got rid of four, meaning it's a written word. We're live okay. right now. This is this is without a filter, but the book was right. a written word. And I started to say, look, if in the big movie that we're all in, the big movie you're in, McConaughey, where action was called when you were born and cut will be called when you leave this life, the camp, it's recording. What are we doing? What are you doing? What's what, 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 my favorite films? The best acting are documentaries. So what's the documentary you're living is the challenge that I was putting on myself. Right. Can you believe in yourself enough to, to, to walk your walk? Can you challenge yourself, Matthew, enough to, 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 to follow, to follow through, to forgive yourself sometimes. Um, and I've also just, I, 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 this tapping into this 11% that we don't tap into yet, this capacity that we as humans have, this potential, I just, man, I think the new frontier is in between the ears and in between the head and the heart. And mm -hmm. there's so much fertile ground there for us as individuals. I don't know how to make a collective change. My hunch is that you make a collective change by an army of individuals that have a, an individual revolution. Mm. about how what the world is and how we go forward between our ears and between our head and our heart that will keep me entertained and, and for, for for the rest of my life and i won't be near close so i think that's why i got into it i wanted to say what what going to be in movies being your own documentary what are you what are you doing what are the hands of time going to be recording um instead of putting something in a capsule that can be objectified later when it comes on theaters or is in your living room on your TV. What are we doing live where it's all one take? That right. was my, my thinking where this is, there is no take two. Right. This is the one where you can't really be overly objective because the recorder's on. And that excited that for myself, but it also excites me for, for people to, to, to perceive their own lives that way. There's a consciousness and awareness there that I think can really help us not maximize our potential, but really increase our capacity for having value in our lives that is quantifiable and qualitative at the same time. Yeah. You know, what I love about the, the approach, and I think it's exactly right. You talk about trying to create some collective good. You try to, you know, inspire people to do more collective good. And everybody's out there saying, do this, vote for that. Um, telling people to, you know, follow these, you know, big ideas. Your work is really trying to inspire people to, to inspire a hunger in people for something better. Okay. And okay. I think it's because, I mean, I think you have confidence that when people look for something better, big good things happen. In other words, you're working on the demand side of good as opposed to on the supply side of good. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want you want to inspire demand for what's better in life. Right. That's what you're writing about, isn't it? Yes. I love That's it. That's the art of living. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, that, that It is. <laughs> yeah. Inspire the demand. I'm not trying to recreate any wheel. I'm not trying to say that there's a new there's a new riddle or a new answer to the riddle. Right. Um, I am trying to, and this is one of the reasons it's fun to talk to you as a as a scientist on this. I am really interested in putting some metrics yeah. to these values, putting some metrics to delayed gratification, which you write and talk about, because I've seen it. I, I've got examples of how it's worked in, in, in my life. I've seen it work in others, but I... I, I, I want to put that up there in almost stock market terms. Like there's ROI here. This is a currency. There's compounding assets, man. This will make you rich in your bank account and your soul's account. That those also that those two, I'm not selling the contradiction that I'm saying, no, you can have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is an interesting thing in the literature. Almost everybody, almost everybody thinks that if they get worldly success, they'll be happier. Worldly success comes in four forms, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, money, power, pleasure, and fame, or not fame, admiration and prestige, localized fame and admiration with it. Money, power, pleasure, and fame, then you'll be happy. It's wrong. Right. It's wrong. What happens is if you pursue happiness, you'll get enough of the worldly rewards. 
So if you pursue okay. happiness and happiness comes from faith, family, friends, and work that serves other people, those are the good four. If you do, if you shoot for the good four, faith or life philosophy, I mean, you and I are Christian men, but other people do it a different way. Faith, family, friends, friendship, real friends, not deal friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and serving other people with your work, that will rebound to the worldly rewards in sufficient quantity for you. Amen. Which is you'll have enough money, enough power, enough pleasure, and enough admiration from other people. But people don't trust it. People don't trust that. And we got to, we, we, we are sold and believe in the moving goalpost of the definition of that word enough. It's a lot of what we're going to be talking That's about. Enough. Yeah. On the 24th, it's, 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 you know, we're going to be talking about a lot about more and defining our more and what, what is our more, more what and why more? Because the quantity of, of more is what we're sold to pursue every day to get those other four things right and and yeah, and yeah I, what is enough what is enough and if i i like your sufficient is it an equal amount sort of is it a is it a reciprocity like the debit equal the sacrifice will the credit will equal the sacrifice somewhat yeah so the interesting thing is that if you go it's funny it's it's a, if you go for the worldly rewards first, then enough never happens. You get on the hedonic treadmill. The hedonic treadmill is the metaphor that you want more feeling, but the treadmill is moving against you, and therefore you never have enough. And by the way, the treadmill is speeding up, yeah. and so you're never making progress. But you got to keep running, and after a while, you're running out of fear because if you stop on a treadmill, yeah, trouble, right? Yeah. And so yeah. that's the problem. If you go for money, power, pleasure, and fame, you become an addict. You become a mm -hmm. success addict. You become a workaholic. You can get addicted to drugs and alcohol and pornography and all the bad stuff in the world, right? Yeah. As opposed to seeing money, power, and pleasure and, and, and the admiration of others as a tool to do good. But the only way you can get there, and if it's a tool, it's enough. I don't know any plumbers who say, I can never have enough tools. No, right. they, they need a, the right number of tools to do their work. So if your work is love, love of the divine, love of your family, love of your friends, love of everybody's expressed through your work, then you will seek the tools to do that in sufficient quantity. That's, the, that's the secret to solving the more dilemma, right? Amen. Amen. But let me ask you this. As, as, as vain people that we are, as altruistic and good-hearted as we are, is there amnesty? Or what would you say to someone who's like, I am a workaholic, but look at what my work does. It actually is to serve, it's serving. Geez, I wish I could quit thinking about it at night when I go to bed. I wish I could take more time. Is there is there is there a category where you go, okay, if you are obsessed with those things and you are chasing you know we have this what's it called there's a term out there now value is it a value posture what is it, 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 it it's a term where you, virtue signaling virtue signal that you go do good you know i mean uh you people do people talk you think oh if i go do good if and i get behind the cause if i if i just give a damn if i care then i'll i'll be happier or it's going to reward me and it doesn't ever fill the thing but i do sometimes go let myself off even and others go well it's in the green. It, it's in the what you're doing. It's may not be true, but it, it it's it's not in the debit section. It's not yeah. taken away from someone else or yourself. And at least it's an asset in the world. So it's not ideal. We're not in the honey hole yet. But you, can, I'll forgive you on this one. Keep it. Is there a category? <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. A lot of people want to be in that category. I hear it all the time. So here's the classic thing that I hear when I talk to couples. My wife and I, we get we get couples ready to get married. So we do like marriage prep stuff. I do all the social science. She does the important stuff like, you know, Christian theology. But I'm, I'm just like doing the science part. And what happens is that a lot of times one member of a couple is a real workaholic, a real self-objectifier. And the other person in the couple hates it because they're being neglected. I mean, this is always the problem. Being married to a workaholic is 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 real is not fun, and always it's the same conversation where the workaholic wants amnesty, as you put it, right? <laughs> like, and, and they'll always say, like, like you don't want me to work, but you love all the nice things that come from my work. 
you love you love the stuff and you love the experiences and you love the vacations and you love the lifestyle, but you don't want me to do what I have to do to get the money. And and the right answer to that is always, I'll take the stuff, but it's a bad substitute for you. Okay. It's not a substitute for you. So this is the, the rejoinder to all the workaholics and the self-objectifiers. There is no amnesty because there everything comes at a price, man. The price is the energy and the time that we spend. And and who do we neglect? We neglect our relationship with 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 the with the divine. We we neglect our relationship with our families and and our 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 spouses. And God forbid our children. Mm. You know how many times have I spent that fourteenth hour at work instead of the first hour with my kids when they were little? Matthew, I am guilty, brother, yeah. and I'm not getting them back. No, in three weeks I'm going to be a grandfather, right? right. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah, because you know my kids or because God is good and so are my kids. They got married real, really, really early. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to screw that one up. I'm not going to screw that one up because I could, I could, I could drink my own Kool-Aid and say, Brooks, your stuff is so important, right, 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 <laughs> but it's right. not more important than my grandson. Mm -hmm. It's not important. Mm -hmm. and, and somebody else is paying the price every time that we're workaholics is what it comes down to. And that's why we need to ration the resources that we're given in a proper way so that we can serve the love relationships that we're privileged to have in our lives. That's my view. Does that sound right to you? Sounds right on. I, 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 what about, and I've been guilty of this and I, but I see it. Spouses, a father or a mother being, I mean, full dedication to parenting to that, to the children. Yeah. At the sacrifice of the marriage. Yeah. Sacrifice of the other. I've had it going through my head. I'm like, sometimes, no, Camille will be okay. But th these three need me right now. They're dependent. And that's a bit of a cop out a lot of times. And I have to remind myself sometimes the old adage of my mom telling me the best best lesson you can give your kids is, is, is show them is how you treat your mother. And yeah. sometimes it's like, no, you guys, y'all just handle it. The, we're back here. Do not interrupt us unless there's a damn emergency. But yeah. I've seen it happen. And you go, wow, there's such a great father. There's such a great mother. But the relationship between the two is splitting. Yeah, I've heard true. amnesty on this going, trust it. It's just a season. They're out of the house at 18. That I've also heard, no, 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 catch it now. Because you're going to need to get that rebalance. The data are clear on this one. The data are, are crystal clear on this one. There is no amnesty. By the way, the number one predictor of a well-adjusted son is a father who loves his mother. It's it's interesting. I mean, it's like that. So much of this behavior, by the way, is is model, as it turns out. So you, what you want is a son who can grow up and love. What you don't want is a son who grows up and can't love. Because if you can't love and be loved, if you push love away, woe be unto you. The best way that you can do that, it's interesting. Have you seen these studies that, that 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 ask, what's the number one predictor of your children growing up and practicing your faith? It turns out it's nothing to do with what you say. It has everything to do with the most physically powerful person in the household, what they do. And so, for example, when I was a little kid, I grew up in Seattle. And uh, I thought my dad, I mean, he was huge. He was six foot two. I thought he could lift the house. Mm. He was so strong, Right. He took, he bowed the knee to no man, Matthew, but he was on his knees on Sunday morning. And that had a big impact on me. Mm. That mm. had a big impact on me. And when I think about my relationship with my wife, I think about my father was in love with my mom. He loved my mom. That was way more important than him playing catch with me out in the backyard, wow. in, ultimately in my own. So, so, you know, that there's a reason that we're commanded to be one flesh because our kids need it and our kids deserve it. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> no amnesty. There's like the amnesty. You're That's cut, you ain't having any of this amnesty stuff. I love it. <laughs> I, well, I mean, listen, we, we got we got to write this up, man. We got to write something called no amnesty. <laughs> it's funny. These are I, laws of the world. I, I, I hear you. I think, you know, overall, we, the world offers us and we give ourselves so many safety nets, so much amnesty. It, it's 
let me throw this let me throw this little analogy at you that or metaphor whatever it is and see what you think and if you can tie this into what i mean by how we kind of give amnesty the icarus story my my hunch is that we suffer from icarus in reverse meaning okay. you know we think it's getting hot and the sun's gonna the, the the heat's gonna melt our wings so we can't fly it but it's like it's still it's 58 degrees fahrenheit it's not hot what are you talking about? Fly further, higher, go. Right. Don't get nervous. Don't choke at the finish line. It's not, hang, hang in there. Don't quit. Don't give yourself the out. Right. Don't put the man-made roof on your head and think, oh, that's my limit. That's my capacity. No further. I shouldn't do that because either I heard that in the past or the world says, ah, uh -uh, stay in line. And that's part of giving ourselves amnesty or out or the world telling us, yeah, 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 cool. That, that's enough. You, you, you can tap out now. Yeah. Yeah. It... yeah. So this is actually a really interesting thing about, about your book and about your work. There's a, there's a recurrent theme. This is, I've, I've heard you talk about this before. Do hard things. Now, yeah. it's interesting because, you know, the if you go back to the 60s, the hippies always said, like, if it feels good, do it. That is life ruining advice. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the amnesty. That I mean, it's like it's the worst. If you want to be a drug addict and have no good relationships and be irresponsible and live on the beach. And I mean, it's good for like a day, but it, it's it's the worst. So you're all about doing hard things. And, and it's interesting because, you know, your spiritual predilection under, helps me understand this better. There is in every religious tradition and every philosophical tradition, an animal path and a divine path. The animal path is if it feels good, do it. The divine path is to not live through your limbic system, which is the part of your brain that gives you your desires. It's, the, it's a part of your brain that was evolved be, uh, starting about 40 million years ago. It's a, it's a paleo mammalian part of your brain but rather experiencing your drives and cravings and emotions uh, in, and your feelings in the prefrontal cortex of your brain, which is, it's like the radio signal to the divine where we can understand our life. It's where, where we're made in God's image. And, and, and when I'm reading you, when I listen to what you say, when you say no amnesty, do the hard things, you're saying choose the divine path. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. That's what that's what I hope I'm I'm saying without 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 saying it even to a a non believer I would say that's what I mean by chasing your more true transcendent self the, the 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 person you know that you 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 can be the one that you do yeah. sleep well with that that so I am that is what I'm that is what I'm saying I, that's what I mean when I'm saying let's race the immortal race the immortal finish line the meet try to meet the measurements across the finish lines that are not mortally measured that can't be measured here and do you know this i mean there's a i used to have when i used to try to when i used to think that way or feel that way yeah i had a i feel very humble but i had a false understanding of humility meaning I lost confidence. Uh -huh. My shoulders would broach over, my head would be down, someone would say something, I'd have an idea, and, and I, well, I wouldn't be able to be involved in the conversation that much because I was just... And it was the wrong... I had bastardized the, you, the understanding of humble. And then I heard this definition of humble being admitting that, that there's, there's more I need to learn. And I was like, oh, geez, I'm in. Okay, I can do that. And my head can still be high, and I can still go hard high, and my shoulders can be back. Um, but that was an early, early struggle with me in my relationship with God, with the divine. Um, and when I am flowing now, it's, 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 I do have that confidence, but I'm chasing an immortal finish line. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking to get out of this life. I'm not in a rush to get to death, but I'm damn excited about what might happen when I get there. You know, <laughs> so it lays it lays in there that I have much more courage and confidence to chase the divine to try and find it, find and create and see the divine here mortally right. when I'm seeking it to get to, to to see it every day and get there in my measurement of my own 
worth or value. Yes. And you, look, you've you've suffered in finding out these truths. I mean, I know you have. You've written about it. You've suffered in finding these things. I mean, living a a life that is not humble is pure misery. It it's just tyranny. Why? Because it's, you're not being honest and you're not facing reality. I mean, humility is all about reality. It's basically, I don't know everything. I'm not perfect. I'm really not all that special, notwithstanding what my publicist is saying. You know, it's like, <laughs> it, the truth is, it, the truth is, and, and when you can lean into the truth, it's an enormous relief. It's a, humility is an enormous relief. And that's why pride, it's interesting, you know, in, in Dante's Inferno, at the bottom of Mount Purgatory, where Dante is, you know, he's, he's narrating this thing where Virgil is taking him down and showing him these stages of hell. At the very bottom, Satan is in the, the lake of, of ice. It's not hot. He's frozen up to his waist. And the reason is because that's pride. Pride freezes you in place. And he's in so much pain that he's distracted and writhing about in pain in the bottom of Mount Purgatory. And that's how we are. And humility thaws the ice. But here's the funny thing. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come. Mother Nature, man, she lies. She lies all the time. She says, money, yeah, you're going to love it. That fifth watch, oh, yeah, flying first class, getting, oh, yeah, just, you're going to love it. You know, being treated special, you're going to love it. Right? She lies all the time, doesn't she? <laughs> Is that Mother well, Nature telling us that? Sure, Mother Nature, for sure. Because Mother Nature has two goals for Matthew and Arthur, which is survive and pass on your genes. Survive and pass on your genes. And you want something better than survive and pass on your genes. You want to touch the finger of God. That's what you want. And that means you got to do something that Mother Nature says is hard. That's why you're not going to settle for reverse Icarus, right? <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That that balance, man. I mean, you know, I always feel like we need some, we need to either go back and regenerate the prescriptive definition of some words that have been bastardized along the way. Or just redefine them yeah like what? Mean, what well like like talking about humility there right i remember always is 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 a kid going wait a minute okay i'm taught i need to be humble be more humility but i don't know anyone that likes to be humiliated yeah that's for sure um and again i battled with my confidence when i would be humble and when i did bend my knee Sometimes I, for a while, I felt less than, and then I found that, oh, that spot, that beautiful spot where you feel like just a speck, but there's so much power in that and being in uh, that speck in, in God's hand. Um, but I wish I would have heard or understood the definition, a better, more constructive definition, like the one I, that I told you spurned me on now, which is admitting I have more to learn. I wish I had yeah. heard that earlier, or that was the definition in Webster's or what have you, or even from my pastor. It just would have been, oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. You know, because yeah. how words are defined. You, We were talking about defining words. What is love to our kids? Yeah. How we treat their, mo their mother, how to our son as a man, how we love their mother. That's a definition. We're defining yeah. it. Yeah. And I think that's part of what we're overall talking about here. What are our definitions? And don't settle for certain definitions that don't feed you, that are not being constructive, that are not paying you back, that are not giving you more quality and value in your life. And even if they're the ones that, you know, some people go, what's well, all I know? Right. It's all I saw. And there's val there's validity to that. I don't know, it just makes me think we, we like Camilla and I are on our foundation. There's a school in Venice we work with in Venice, California. We took took them on a field trip to go clean the beach in Venice, California. Four kids were going, 17 year old kids. Wow, I've never been to the beach before. <laughs> and they're from Venice. You're like, oh, oh, you didn't know that this was even out here. And they just stared at the horizon going, I've never been able to see that far. Yeah. 17 years old. So where do we redefine and where do we, where can people also go 
question the definition in their mind, how they start the day or before they go to bed. All these things you're talking about are defined a good night's sleep by going through your prayer. Um, there's tools. There's, yeah. There, there's yeah. And what I like about the way that you, because you've given this a lot of thought and you're, you're very human and vulnerable about the fact that you're not perfect, that you've had to learn some of this stuff the hard way. You know, as I'm going through it, it's funny because it's almost as if you move from one formula of life that seems right, but isn't to the harder formula of life that seems wrong, but is true. And mm -hmm. so I'm kind of like, I'm trying to articulate it in a way and, and, and let me give it a shot. All right. Um, Mother Nature and, you know, the economy and social media and the whole outside world says, you want to be happy? I'll tell you how to be happy. <clears throat> Use people, love things, and worship yourself. That's it. And I'm reading you. It's like, no, 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 no. Use things, love people, and worship God. It's almost as if it were that simple, right? Hard, but right. simple. Yeah. And that's how you're trying to live your life, right? I'm trying to, yes. Um, you know, the... the... <laughs> Back to the I and the me. I do seek to to synonymize. And I'll see, <laughs> I hope, I hope this comes across as I mean it. <laughs> when I'm the God, the, the 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 seeking the God. When I when I'm most clearly seeing that God, I'm seeing God in myself. Mm -hmm. Then I start to synonymize love yourself more in that way you are loving god uh -huh. more have the right kind of self-love the i and not the me and you uh -huh. will be serving others more and serving god more right. my hunch is that it does have to go through each one of us individually to expand and scale i uh I think it has to be a personal experience. We're back to the ego, the I, and the me. Um, but the line I know that I got to watch, and I think I, I think a lot of people have to watch, is that when you start to find the synthesis and this, this, this how the God and the I are synonyms, it can you got to balance it because where you don't get where you're aligned, where the ego is aligned with that service. Because the ego can start running ahead and the service and God's over there kind of going, hey, that's not what I was talking about. Um, and that's that's a that's a, a a part of the journey I'm on right now is trying to keep those balanced and make and, and see that is how I'm seeing is the way I'm going forward in, informed by God. So therefore, yes, being the subjective. And I think I'm getting my hunch is that you'll be saying. It's that that the seeking of God is not necessarily an obje being objective. It's not. It's actually being more subjective. That's my. That's kind of my my where I'm coming at. It's actually being the most subjective because God's yeah. in each, in in each one of us. So it's not like you jump out, you go to church on Sunday, you get objective because you're listening to someone else in God, and then Monday through Friday you get subjective. I it, it's it's when it does. It's when it's when it's when our Spiritual side is not just stepping outside of ourselves; it's stepping actually more inside ourselves. That's maybe yeah. Better. So you are openly in touch with your spiritual side. You are a practicing Christian man, as am I. Um, how do you practice that? I mean, I go and you go to church on Sunday morning. I got that. How do you practice that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? How? What do you do? What are your practical? Because here's the deal. Once again, Mother Nature. She wants you to consume. She wants you to look in the mirror. She wants you to do all the things that you do. And, and your divine nature, flying higher, doing the hard thing, means you're subjecting yourself to protocols. You're going to the gym mm -hmm. in terms of your spiritual life. So what's what's in your what's in your spiritual gym, Matthew? In my spiritual gym. Um, I mean, I, I, I start off with the simple one, the gratitude. And have a look around, measure what makes me smile, what I got in my life to be thankful for. Try to check in on a couple of things that 
maybe I speed read through that I've kind of taken for granted. Um, I try to make it a habit. I can get better at this habit of, 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 of going and checking in with everybody in my family at least once a day about how they're doing and really try to listen. I'm trying to be a better listener, actually, with them. Understand them more than me trying to be understood. Um, I gratitude is the main ritual is gratitude a few times a day to go through, yeah. and, that, and and whether that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or a five minute pause with with someone in the family between between meetings, um, and then the end of the day, just doing doing some inventory about what my day was and what we got to look forward to, and then getting myself out of the way because I yeah that's yeah. there. And, and, yeah, yeah, and and it's interesting because the, the, tomorrow. Yeah, I mean the gratitude that you talk about is enormous scientific literature on gratitude. Of course, you know. Uh, I mean, you find that people can raise their happiness within ten weeks with a simple gratitude list by ten to twenty percent. So it's a very practical thing to do. But like humility, it's both hard and unnatural. We're wired to be ungrateful. We're wired to be prideful. But it's realistic. I mean, the truth is, look. I mean, look at I mean, our lives are. We're living in the United States of America in a free country, able to practice our, our faith and work, and we have enough food on the table, and our kids are healthy. And, and and even if all those things aren't perfect, we still have plenty to be grateful for. So it's realistic to be grateful. So to be to relax into the honesty of the truth of our lives, as opposed to living the lie of ingratitude, it's 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 what a relief, yeah. <laughs> right? It's a beautiful thing. You also write about. I mean, you don't write about it in exactly this language, but but it resonates a lot with me. You do pilgrimages. You've done yeah. pilgrimages. You're a man of pilgrimages. And pilgrimages are, are ancient rituals in almost every spiritual tradition. You know, I walk the Camino de Santiago across northern Spain with hundreds of miles across northern Spain. I do it with my wife. I've done it twice. And and you just all you do is walk. Just walking. What are you gonna do? You walk and pray, walk and pray, walk and pray, walk and pray, walk and pray. And you're you're a man of you're a man of silence and pilgrimage too. Ah, uh, yes, and I'm, I'm I'm due for another probably. My thankfully I have a wife who 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 knows me well enough that tells me, get out of here. You need to go. You need to go on a walkabout. Um, <laughs> it's a you know it's it's a it's it's much much more fun spiritual journey. It's a much more fun way to go to the gym than going to the gym. I don't know. It's much. It's it's more. It's it's it it involves action. It involves a physicality. It involves getting lost. It involves uh, uh, um, not knowing or caring where the destination is at some point. Yeah. Uh, it involves, as you said, going. You said earlier, going to a different place and not having because you can't be objective because it's a, it's because of the the new place you're in. I, I like to go to a place where. I do not speak the language. Yeah. Where nobody does know my name. I need that for personal refuel. Yeah, for sure. Because I think coming from being famous, everyone comes to me with an automatic biography on me. And I'm wanting to go, and I want to meet some strangers again to see if I still got it on my own. <laughs> you know what I mean? As a human. As a human. As yeah. a human. So on those pilgrims, it, I have something with about day 12. It seems to be about day 12, 12 days before I shake the monkeys off my back, before yeah. I battle through the guilt and say, the buck stops here on this stuff you're doing, McConaughey, and I forgive you on this stuff, McConaughey. So let's go forward and be human yeah. and keep seeking. Um, and then the trip's wonderful. Then I'm in flight. Then I'm like, oh, I could live here. I could... I could, I could, this could be my existence. And now that means it's okay for me to go if I want to. Um, to not have those things that I rely on, that I just by default go to, to not have that fridge that I have stocked right now, to not have the, the communication, to not have my family that I miss. All those things, it's, it's a bit, it's a purge. You know, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a purge. And, and because it's active, I don't know. It's also it's just more fun and killing two birds with one stone, spiritually and physically. Yeah. And you're in a space to listen. I mean, yeah. it's, if God's going to talk to you, you got to shut up and listen. And you got to go someplace where you're out of your routine, where you're not just yelling the whole yeah. time, right? Yeah. 
what's the, what's your best way when you say because look not everyone can take walk across spain not everyone can go i'm taking a 22-day walkabout yeah what's your yeah what i recommend i talk i talk to a lot of uh, you know a lot of young men and women who are graduating from college and really at loose ends. I mean, really at loose ends because they think that they're going to find their passion. No, they think their passion is going to find them in college, which is a real misconception. I mean, you, you only experience your passion in life by listening deeply as it turns. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I recommend for people who are really um, very insecure when they're graduating from, from college or graduate school is that they, they, they start a protocol of getting up way before they're comfortable, usually before it's late, yeah, yeah. and walking for 60 to 120 minutes without any devices. It's a miniature pilgrimage every single day. Walking is, is, is ergonomically sound and it has all kinds of good physical properties, et cetera. It is really the spiritual exercise. It's the right spiritual exercise. Um, and and you're, you're alone with your thoughts walk by yourself leave before dawn make it a routine don't entertain yourself and if you're bored better yes better yes <laughs> so then and anybody can do almost anybody uh, we're all, practically all ambulatory and you know it's not it's not and, you know almost everybody can do that and this is a game changer for young people that i find a total yeah. game changer because it starts them on it, it's not like they're going to find the truth they're not going to find the answers. You know what they're going to find, Matthew? They're going to find the questions. Right. And that's what we need. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I'm, oh, that's, 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 that's strong. I no doubt know that that would improve the quality of anybody's life. Yeah. Yeah. That. And again, there's something about that 430 in the morning when the world is quiet and you haven't opened up your old laptop and no one's asked you a question. There's no stimulus coming in. Even the dogs aren't up to be fed. Uh -uh. Head out on a little walk at any particular pace you want. Yep. And you do get bored. Yep. Good. I agree with you. Good. I tell my kids that all the time. You're bored. Great. That's the point. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. You need to get into your default mode network if you want to talk about neuroscientifically. But more spiritually, you need to be in a, in a, in a state of listening in a state of profound listening. And we all need that. Yep. Man, I think we're out of time because you got to go, you got to go, you know, get on with the serious business of life. I could talk to you all day. Yeah, dude, let's do, we could do, we could do a 12 hour session. I think that's right. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person next time. Maybe, maybe we will make that bicycling trip across Vietnam or yeah. up into the Himalayas. Like we've, we've tried to do a pilgrimage together a couple of times over the past month, but uh, we'll make it happen. Let's do it in the human flourishing business. I like that. Flourish. That sounds so much better than some of the other terms that are thrown around out well, there. That's what's going on in the art of living. <laughs> and I hope everybody learns your art of living because everybody's going to have a better life as a result of that. I'm certainly enriched by this. And thank you for what you're doing, my friend. Well, thank you, Arthur. This has been magnificent and really educating and entertaining for me. And I look forward to continuing discussions and learning from you. Me too. Talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Just Me keep too. it. Oh, no.